Hello, my name is Andrew Harvey, and today I would like to share with you some observations on names and naming in Gorwa. Gorwa is a South Cushitic uh, language of the Afro-Asiatic phylum, and it's an endangered language spoken by approximately 130,000 individuals in Babati district of central Tanzania. Analysis of the use of Gorwa names shows a decline and a reorientation towards Christian, Muslim, and Swahili naming conventions. As such, the naming tradition under examination may itself be viewed as also endangered. This is not trivial, as personal names and how they are bestowed provides a window into the cultural life of the people, as well as into historical language dynamics. I interview Gorwa people listening to relevant life stories in the Gorwa language and cultural material archive. I also analyzed a list of around 750 Gorwa personal names collected in Babati during fieldwork between 2012 and 2016, and I'll base an ethnographic sketch of Gorwa naming conventions on this. Many of the semantically transparent names in the list refer to actions or events, a common theme throughout naming conventions on the African continent. More specifically, many personal names play a role in warding off evil, ensuring family continuity, as well as honoring figures of power. Recent borrowings from Swahili and English provide insight into the nature of these relatively new contacts. I'd like to begin by situating myself within the larger context in which this talk is taking place. Uh, I'm a linguist, a postdoctoral researcher based at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics, and I'm interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as events through language contact and linguistic arts. I've been working on Gorwa since 2012. Uh, in 2018, I began working on Ihanzu, a Bantu language of the area, and this year I begin a project which includes Hadza, a language isolate, also part of the Tanzanian Rift Valley linguistic area. On this map, Gorwa is spoken in an area within, but significantly smaller than the area enclosed by the red circle on the map inset. Uh, from Lake Babati, seen here below, uh, the town of the same name, Gorwa-speaking communities stretch west to the Duru River and east up to the border of Terengir National Park. Other natural borders do not exist, and uh, Gorwa speakers live together with speakers of Mbugwe in communities as far north as Magugu, and together with speakers of Rangi and Alagua southwards into Bereko. To give a sense of what the language sounds like, uh, this is a short clip from a recording of Akobu Saware talking about farming sisal when he was young. Katana hat ita katanda atan lo king gagane gari. Muku uren adur atan kure ma kote tet bonde ko do kate kame kinte kame kinte kame kinte kame gari ngin hub katanda ni no kardurari kandu ka kus ba ka kus atan di sille ita nan ko ko habra bonde ko tate ki anto ko ko ha ti pi manaka. Mugudabara <laughs> Mugdauren <laughs> kunbu silingit ya. Kudosi mata kudosi mata kudosi alu ana di sababu alu di si alu kase aka o masa wara har kase si gaza ko mertuai. Culturally, a Gorwa child is given a name between a week to a month following birth, and the choice of names is very often the responsibility of the mother and her mother-in-law. Uh, that the mother-in-law would play such a role makes sense, uh, taking into account that Gorwa. Uh, residence patterns are often uh, patrilocal. That is, following marriage, uh, the new couple will move and live at or near the husband's father's compound. This makes the mother-in-law a key figure in the bride's new life. Names, uh, especially those of women, may change throughout life. Uh, a woman may be given a new name to use in place of her childhood one uh, by her biological parents on the day of her wedding. A uh, woman may also be called a special name by her husband, akin more or less to a pet name called by one spouse to the other. A sickly infant may be given a new name to replace their original one. 
This is a process directed by the traditional doctor who will choose the name, often of a recently deceased ancestor, whose spirit is said to be causing the illness. This is accompanied by a ritual offering, typically of a cow or goat, and the animal is slaughtered and some of the meat is uh, left in the yard of the troubled household. If the offering is taken by hyenas, often seen as incarnations of the dead, then this is seen as acceptance of the name change and the appeasement of the spirit. Many names in the collection belong to one or more salient subgroups, the largest being that comprising animals, birds, and, and insects. So the name Dirang uh, comes from lion, Dirang. Genai uh, comes from the word Genang, which is falcon. Ingigi uh, is derived from Ingigi, which is locusts. Kwaang comes from Kwaang, which is rabbit, and Sakari comes from guinea fowl. A second salient subgroup is names derived from plants and trees. So for example, we've, we have hangari, which comes from hangal, which is a sodom apple. Losi, which comes from losi, beans. Dati, uh, from a species of tree. Hari, which means weedy grasses. And hrimpurmo, uh, which is a species of creeping plant. Uh, note that the majority of the plants and trees listed here are essential components in Gorwa traditional medicine with roles in physical or ritual purification. A further salient group is that of names derived from beer, beer brewing, and the consumption of beer. So bura is beer, uh, tuko. Uh, takasi is a partially fermented sorghum mash. Dasho comes from the word dasho, which is grinding sorghum roughly uh, for beer. Sidame is beer for a special guest, and hufo is the act of drinking alcohol. Again, the preparation and consumption of beer is a key feature of Gorwa life. Furthermore, we have other names which derive from actions or events. So we have bu, which is from buum, harvesting. Haima, which is from hayuma, traveling. Chadue, from chadue, visiting the traditional doctor. Giro, from Gira, which is laying in ambush, and Siasi, which uh, means to refuse. So in addition to these names, all of which are semantically transparent in Gorwa, there's also a huge store of names whose meanings are not clear or which do not come from Gorwa, and some of which we will examine later. The popularity of such names becomes clearer when one examines how names are chosen. Uh, a predominant method is that of what I call circumstantial naming, that is, the act of naming a child based on the situation surrounding their birth. For a good example, I quote Aira Helilawi, who is talking about the birth of her youngest daughter. So, she says, On the 17th of November, I gave birth to that child. Uh, there was a rain shower which passed. Ha! A light rain. They said, This is Yahi! Because there was a light rain which passed, I said, hey, this girl is Yahi. Yahi, of course, being a noun which means a light rain shower. However, despite this being a popular convention, it's not the only way in which the name of a child may be chosen. Another popular convention is familial naming, that is, the naming of a child based on the name of a family member. In Gorwa culture, this is typically done by using the name of a family member of the child's grandparents' generation. Additionally, the family member must no longer be living. And again, Aira Helilawi gives another example, this time talking about the naming of her oldest son. And she says, We Gorwa, we name children by other people's names. They, and they will call my first child by the name of my husband's father. Because the elder of that house, i.e. my husband's father, was alive, my husband's father said, he shall be named Fante. Because of my elder brother, in the past I lived at his house, I ate the meat of his cattle, and I really respected him. So his name is Fante, referring to the child. Names may also be given as talismans, that is, as practical tools to ward off death and illness. Uh, three such talismanic names are Heha, which means gluttony, 
Waha, waha, which means alcoholism, gwa'i, meaning death. Note that the circumstances around giving a talismanic name are quite specific. Uh, this is typically only done in cases in which a mother has had a series of miscarriages or has lost previous children very early due to illness. It's thought that the unattractiveness of this name will keep malevolent forces from desiring the newborn child and thus ensure his or her survival. Uh, naming may also be tributary, that is, a child may receive the name of a particularly powerful figure. Uh, two such names, for example, are Mao and Guandu. Both uh, are Gorwa traditional doctors, and this is an image of Ako Laguen Goti at Do Guandu, thought to be the house of one of these powerful doctors. But as a caveat, however, because both of these traditional doctors were Gorwa themselves, they were both given names with a transparent semantic meaning, Mao meaning cats and Guandu being a species of plant. As such, any given Gorwa person with either of these names may have got them either through their association with traditional doctors, so that is tributary naming, or through being born when cats or this plant were around, that is circumstantial naming. In fact, these prominent Gorwa naming traditions overlap and interact in ways that allow us to make some interesting guesses, both about the past and about the Gorwa people themselves. So take, for example, the name Kea. This is not a Gorwa word as such, but comes from the acronym K-A-R, a common way to refer to the king's African rifles, imaged here around the beginning of the First World War. Uh, the regional fighting force raised for defense and security from the early 1900s uh, to independence. Uh, and throughout my time working with Gorwa consultants, I've always recorded their names as well as their birth dates, which makes the roughly 250 person list a very interesting sample with which to test hypotheses about the utility of Gorwa names for understanding Gorwa history. So for example, I've worked with uh, two Gorwa consultants whose last names were Kea, which means that following local convention, their father's first, na first names were Kea. One Kea was born in 1968, and one was born in 1972. Now, given that we know that this was the name given to their fathers, this means that their fathers received their names most likely at some point while the KAR was operational. Unfortunately, nobody in my sample was born before 1904, but one would assume that if the name Kea is associated with the King's African Rifles, and that the King's African Rifles were formed in 1904, that therefore nobody would have been given the name Kea before 1904, but that the name Kea may persist after 1964 in new children born and given names of deceased family members. In fact, this can be tested on another similarly non-Gorwa name, Manamba. Manamba refers to another colonial era scheme, one in which vast areas of Brachistegia woodland were cleared in an effort to eradicate the tsetse fly habitat, which was spreading sleeping sickness both among cattle and among humans. Gorwa men were drafted into labor by the colonial administration and forced to work in camps at shifts for 30 days. One of the most important details in popular recollection is that each person was assigned a number, hence Manamba, and this is what the labor program is called among Gorwa today uh, and in the past. So children born during this era could have been named circumstantially as such. Henry Fosbrook's report outlines key dates during which Manamba took place, beginning in 1945 and ending in 1952. One Gorwa consultant of mine with the first name Manamba was born in 1948 uh, at the height of the forced labor and whose name was circumstantial. A second Gorwa consultant was born in 1968, more than 10 years after the end of the forced labor. But it is not her first name, which is Manamba, but her last name. This therefore means that her father was most likely born during the early stages of forced labor. Crucially, none of my Gorwa consultants born before 1945 carry Manamba as either their first or last names. As such, we see a pattern. A salient event is marked by the circumstantial naming of children, and may 
echo into the future through surnames for one generation and then through familial naming for the following ones. And in addition to marking historical events, names may also mark historical contact with other groups. The name Gidahonda, for example, is patently not Gorwa. Instead, its structure suggests origins in Datoga, a cluster of southern Nilotic languages spoken in the area. This is borne out in a story told by Akobu Sakware about a tree in the center of Yuratonic village. So he says, This Kalalandi in the past was contested. A person called Gidahonda and Siged. Siged is the Gorwa chief. Gidahonda is the Datoga chief. Um, and on this map, showing where many of the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area are spoken, one can see that Gorwa and Datoga speech communities are currently in contact. And indeed, the Gorwa name Gidahonda could very well have been a tributary name given to a child in deference to the historical Datoga leader. Perhaps even more intriguing is the possible story behind the name Selema. Again, with no discernible meaning in Gorwa, I was resigned to it remaining a mystery until I read this article by Schunenberger about names in Yamwezi, which says that if a birth went on swiftly, without complications, a baby girl may be called Selema, a name taken from the verb Selema, to flow like the rainwater on the soil. Interestingly, we can see that Gorwa and Yamwezi are not currently in contact, and from my understanding have not historically been in contact. Instead, this may be a story of a small number of speakers, perhaps just a family, perhaps just an individual, making the faintest of marks on the Gorwa language. But, however, faint, a mark nonetheless. Finally, and once again using the data from the names of my Gorwa consultants as a sample, I've assigned a value of 2 to an individual who uses their Gorwa name as the primary way to identify themselves. I assigned a value of 1 to an individual who has a Gorwa name or knows it, but who does not use it. And to those people who do not have a Gorwa name, but who speak Gorwa and are otherwise culturally Gorwa, I assigned 0, and plotted along with their birth, birth rates, a trend emerges in which Gorwa names are most in use by older individuals and least in use with young people. Over the course of a century, a rough decline in favor of Christian, Muslim, or Swahili names of around 50% can be discerned. As such, I think it's fair to see Gorwa names and naming as an endangered domain of speech within an endangered language. And I suppose to conclude, throughout this talk, I hope I've given some sense of the form, uh, system, and overall genius behind Gorwa names and naming. Uh, when taken individually, uh, they're a very public but at once a very intimate expression of Gorwa identity, and when taken together, a subtle but telling annal of Gorwa history. Thank you, and these are my references.